Anyway, so we are very lucky to have him here, and he will be presenting to you today. So please give him a warm welcome. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, let's try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. You know, I need just as much energy as you do, because uh, I ate just as much as you did. And um, so therefore, I'm going to try to keep you engaged, and we're going to have a lot of fun through this presentation. Uh, as mentioned, I'm currently at St. Leo University. I'm a I have a really interesting uh, position there because I have um, the best of both worlds. I have a 50% assignment in academic affairs. I teach social work. Uh, just undergraduate. I, I try to stay away from the graduate program. Um, and then I also have an appointment in student services. We're, we're a very large uh, military veteran serving community. We serve about 2,700. We have about 2,700 veterans a semester. Wow. at the university and, and when I say the university as a whole we have academic centers similar to to where we're at at Troy so we're serving a very large military presence um, and when I decided to come back last year I was at I put together their uh, I was at the University of Southern California and established their military social work program there for about five years and when I decided to come back to um, Florida um, it was just natural for me to go back to St. Leo given their military presence I'm a graduate from St. Leo um, and how did I get here? And my students always ask me this, like, Dr. Cole, how did you get, how did you go from being a Marine in special operations to being a social worker? Actually, we shouldn't even be able to put both in the same sentence as an oxymoron. Um, so this is what I tell a lot of folks. I wanted to be the next Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Everything I did in the Marine Corps was to get me to that level uh, where I can provide my Marines the best care possible and be able to leave them anywhere I had to leave them. And all it took literally was about a 15 minute drop to break my back. So I broke my back in three places. Um, accidents happened. And, uh, but I didn't want to accept the fact that I was no longer going to be a Marine. And I had a wonderful uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Coates, who recently retired a couple of years back. And his kind words, I had, I'll never forget this, Lieutenant Colonel Coates and Sergeant Major Naughton. And they looked at me and they said, uh, at that time I was a corporal, they go, Corporal Cole, you're no longer good for the Marine Corps. Wow. That was the words. And that, that was a lot of love. That, he meant it in, in a good way. And I remember sitting there and not accepting the fact that I was no longer going to be a Marine. I wanted to be the what? The next Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. And now I had a Colonel and a Sergeant Major telling me, you need to come up with a new plan. What was my problem? Well, the same problem that a lot of veterans have. I did not have plan B. My plan A, B, and C was to be a Marine. I didn't have a plan B. I wanted to stay in the Marine Corps. So I remember going through a physical, going through my, my med board and going to a physical and it was a, a Navy captain, and my wife was with me when we were doing this physical, and the Navy captain goes, well, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. Uh, well, how's your back? Doesn't hurt. And I remember my wife sitting there the whole time going, shaking her head, shaking her head to this Navy captain. And I remember even doing jumping jacks in front of her. I got down, did push-ups, I even did sit-ups, because I did not want to be separated from the Marine Corps. I remember earlier in one of your presentations, there was this concept about being disabled. I didn't want to have that title. I didn't want to have that title. That was a disabled veteran. Didn't want it. Don't care for it. Even to the point that when I got out of the Marine Corps, I would still look at civilians as lazy. Because even with a broken back, I would wake up at 7 in the morning, 6 in the morning, and still go for a run. Even though I knew for a fact that for the next three days, I wasn't going to be able to walk. There was this mental element of it. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be discussing about what is it, this drive, what's this worldview, and what happens with shattered, and what do we got to think about from a clinical perspective. And I'm it. I'm a great case, and I'm going to be able to bring in this kind of information. We're going to have a lot of fun. So I do have some, some uh, PowerPoints, obviously. I'm going to try not to kill you with PowerPoints. We're going to engage it. But if you don't mind, can you pass these back? I, I know I brought enough. And we'll pass these around as well. Just grab one and pass them around. Now, 
Dr. Axum had some great discussions about the military culture and what the military culture is. And we're going to briefly talk about that because I know he mentioned it, but I want to highlight some, some very important elements to it. And then we talked about suicide and this element of what's happening with the suicide rate in the military. So I'm not going to cover that because that was well covered. But then we're going to talk about families and we're going to talk about children. Because I think that's a very important asset and something that we need to be thinking about. So I'm going to start you with a short video. And this, this short video I think really speaks to why are we here. Now, of course, a short video never plays when you want it to play, right? What's the matter with you? I, I guess I just can't take it, sir. What did you say? It's my name, sir. I, I just can't stand the shelling anymore. culture. It's a powerful element of the message. I can't say it's the same message we use today. I think our officers are better prepared and equipped to look at the stress of the war. But it's a message that resonates in the military, whether we want to or not, which is that we're not going to accept weakness, either mental or physical weakness. And it resonates in veterans who are coming out which is that they don't want to identify with any elements of either physical or mental illness. And I'll show you that film, or that little clip right there, because it's something that we really want to work on. To first is understand what the mental element is of accepting either you're hurt physically or mentally, and also understand what's behind it, what's this thrive? Why do we thrive not to, under, not to accept the fact that we're injured? Now, of course, we don't, we don't uh, perform this way anymore. I think we've become uh, much better prepared to address mental illness. But we still have some in senior command officers that would behave this way, that would act this way. And all honestly, I probably would have been one of them. And all honestly, if I would have had a junior NCO in my command, I probably would have behaved that way. Why? Because that's the way that everyone around my command behaved with us when I was going through the ranks. That if I had an injured knee or an injured ankle, the only way to get through that pain was to do what? Run it out. It wasn't going to go see the medic. Any minute if I went to see the medic, the medic was like, uh, it, they used to call me sticks in the core. Like, uh, sticks, uh, you're better off if you just run it out. So we just ran it out. So it's that mental element of, you know, and the culture element. So one of the things that we're gonna to try to cover, some of the things we're gonna to try to cover today is this element of military culture, which is supported and, and discussed by Dr. Axum. Give you this kind of historical context. We're a very young nation, but in our short span as a nation, we've been at war for a very long time. We were created in conflict and we stay in conflict. But we've had individuals 
always looking at veterans since the beginning of our nation. All the way back to the pilgrims. And we're going to have that little discussion, which is, this is not new. Yet we treat it as such. We're still puzzled by it. But yet we've been at war for centuries. We're going to talk about families and communities. And think about counseling from a worldview perspective. Think about what happens when a young Marine or sailor or soldier goes into the service with a very benign, very kind of virgin perspective about what life is in society, and that's shattered in combat. And then we have them in our office, and what are we supposed to do? So, as, as mentioned earlier, the military is, is a subset of society. Actually, I love research, so the way I always look at the military, it's a, it's a perfect, simple sample of our population. They represent every ethnicity, every sex, gender. It represents every religious um, and social class because we're an all-voluntary military force. What's really unique about our current military, unlike even the one that I served and others have served in, is that because of the current economy of the country, we're seeing a more educated military than ever before. We actually have individuals who have MBAs, MAs, enlisting in the military, not even seeking officer candidate schools, they're enlisting in the military. Why? Well, it's, you got a secure job, you got a secure paycheck, and the health insurance isn't bad. And if you want a child, it's, it's pretty inexpensive. We're governed by very set laws, norms, traditions, and culture and organizational culture elements to it. We're set by very strict rules. And these strict rules don't go away the moment you receive your DD-214. These culture elements don't go away as soon as we receive. Now, I remember receiving my DD-214. I was so happy when I got that piece of paper. So my DD-214 is your, uh, I'm sorry? Can you explain what that is? Yes, when you are separated from the military, uh, you receive a form, which is a DD-214. Every veteran should have one. And it's going to explain to, the, uh, to whoever uh, wants to look at it if the individual was honorably discharged, dishonorably discharged, or have their medals on there, or have what their military occupational uh, specialty was in the military, how long they served. Uh, so it has an enormous amount of information uh, from the point that that person is discharged. And it's a, it's a, a this sheet of paper is not very large. We always tell folks, make copies of it so you won't lose it. I was so happy to receive that DD-214 and drive across country. And I remember getting to, to Tampa, because I was in, in California, getting to Tampa with a DD-214, and I thought my entire world was going to change. And it did, in many ways. I ended up in a social work program. I still don't know how I ended up in social work. But I ended up in a social work program. And I remember sitting in the social work program, and I had a faculty member there, and I had a really hard concept accepting the fact that clients have self-determination. I was like, self-determination? What are you talking about? So I remember raising my hand. I was like, well, obviously they don't know what they need. I should be able to tell them what they need. And I almost got dismissed from the program. This faculty member could not accept the fact that I was still mentally a Marine. I still will wear a high and tight. This is not a high and tight. This is just a nice little haircut here. <laughs> I will still wear a high and tight. I'm awfully close, but this is not a high and tight. I was still had a high and tight. I was still addressed faculty as ma'am, sir, yes ma'am. And they would get upset at me. They're like, I'm not a ma'am. Just My name is Dr. So-and-so. I was like, yes ma'am. And, and we would just go around this. I would look at my peers, and I was like, you need to get your act together. Uh, I remember one, I never forget this one time I was in class and we're, you know, we're in class like this and there's students outside running around campus, I don't know what they were doing. And I'm like, hang on a minute, they're not letting me pay attention to this app. And I got out and walked out and I had them all against the wall. So they need to get their act together because we couldn't pay attention to this professor. And I remember this, this professor looking at me like, Oh my God, where did this person come from? <laughs> so they try to dismiss me from the program. And I'll give you this, this element about set laws and norms. 
There's something very clear about the military, which is you know who's in charge. There's a very clear chain of command. And even when I work now with veteran students, they're always looking for a chain of command. Not because they want to report, but they want to understand that there's some form of structure. Even in therapy, they seek structure. Even in the workplace, they're seeking structure. Because it's what we've become accustomed to. So I remember this faculty member takes me, uh, and it wasn't even an appeals element, she just wanted me dismissed from the program. Takes me to the dean, I try to explain to the dean, it's like, no, I really like social work. Don't ask me why, but I do like social work. I want to help people. I don't know why, but I don't. And then they wanted to push me into criminology. It was interesting. They were, they're like, you know, you, you're really good at criminology. I was like, no, I have a broken back. I can't run after anybody. I like social work. And the dean's like, well, I'm not sure this is going to work for you. And I said, well, I said, if you don't mind, um, who's your chain of command? <laughs> I was like, I would really like to speak to the chain of command. And she looked at me, she goes, oh, no, son. There's no chain of command here. You can talk to whoever you want. I was like, there's no, like, there's no chain of command? She goes, no. I was like, OK. So I remember walking out of her office. I walked across campus to the president's office. <laughs> I made an appointment with the university president, who's still there now, Dr. Kirk, a great mentor of mine. And I met with Dr. Kirk. And I said, sir, you've got a major problem in your institution. <laughs> and he goes, well, what is it? You know, I introduced myself in the small talk part. I said, nobody knows you're in charge. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? So I explained my situation. He appealed for me. And when the president appeals for your case, and then I won, I became a social worker. And, but it's, this, and I didn't mean harm. I was still trying to assimilate myself into this culture. I was still trying to assimilate myself that I can't point to people and say, you better get your act together. I can't do that. I have to stick my hands in my pocket. You better get your act together. <laughs> it was really interesting, though. The, these little mannerisms and things that I would do in the core weren't not acceptable now in the civilian society. These norms and traditions weren't part of who I was anymore. I wasn't Sticks or Sergeant Cole, now I was just Jose. I was like, Jose? That would sound so odd. When people were like, Jose, I was like, who's Jose? <laughs> that sounded so awkward to me. Even to the point now, obviously the haircut, I still wear a gig line, I still use military time, and if I'm in a committee, I'm always trying to take charge. Right? So I try to avoid committees because of it, because I've learned that, because they move so slow, and I wanted, we got a mission. And Dr. Exum mentioned this element of mission. And Dr. Exum was a chair of my dissertation, and he could speak to, and, and, and Dr. Zalakhet was all, also in my dissertation committee. I treated my doctoral program like I was invading Grenada. It was a mission. <laughs> From day one to the last day, I treated it like a mission. I had a plan, and I don't think anybody got in the way. No. So I treated it like a mission. Why? Because that was what I was trained to do. If you're going to do something, act on it, think about it, pre-plan, and get it done. And, and it worked for me. And those are the kind of tools that we're going to be talking about. Think about the strengths that your client has that's helped them survive in combat and use that to help them survive in this society, in this world. So why? What's the appeal? Why would anybody join the service? And I kind of mentioned the financial aid element to it, right? The, the financial element to it. But besides that, why would anybody in the right mind join the service during combat? We're in two theaters, well, we're in one theater now, but why would anybody join? Well, there's many reasons why individuals join the military, obviously. The answering to call, uh, you know, service to call and, and serve your country. The proud element, and, and we, you know, that's a huge element mostly for our young, young uh, uh, recruits. This element of educational benefits, mostly the post 9-11 GI Bill now is wonderful compared to the old one. Now, what's sad about the education element is that out of the, let's say, 99% of individuals who qualify for educational benefits, who get out of the service, only 10% actually seek higher education. It's about 10%. Out of that 10% that seek higher education, about only 1% graduate with a degree from college. 1%. Now, uh, everybody has DOD, VA, everybody's been trying to figure out what's happening. What's the gap? What are we doing wrong? What are universities doing wrong? Are we recruiting the wrong student? Are we admitting students that shouldn't have been admitted? Should we be providing more services? What service should that be? 
And that's what I do at St. Leo right now, is try to work with faculty who have students in their class that have traumatic brain injury, work with faculty who come, they're like, I'm scared, because I have a veteran, and he cursed in my class. <laughs> really? That's, that's all he did? Okay, well, we're good then. Right? That, and part of it is that they, they have this, this, this image of what higher education should be. And that image has changed through time. And now we're seeing more and more veterans seeking the post 9 11 GI Bill because of the wonderful benefits of it. Uh, family traditions. As I mentioned, uh, the financial component to it. Personal improvement. There are individuals who say, I'm better off in the military than I am out here in the street. Right? And there's enormous financial improvement there. A perfect example was that right after 9 11, there was a rush. We had, actually, it was really interesting. If you look historically, right after 9-11, the same thing happened during the Civil War. Right at the beginning of the Civil War, the Union had no problems filling their ranks. As soon as they realized, well, this is a real war, the Union had a hard time recruiting folks to go to war. Same thing happened here. Right after 9-11, we had no problems filling in the ranks. As soon as everybody realized, like, hey, this is a real war, the Army, Marine Corps, everybody was kind of challenged to, to maintain the status of demand and manpower that we needed. The Army uh, had a very interesting experiment, and I call it an experiment because I don't think they realized the impact, which is let's weigh certain uh, crimes and admitted uh, individuals who had some form of gang affiliation into the Army. Then NPR found out about it, NPR does a report on it, and the Army says, you know what, yes we did it, we needed the manpower, Let's go back and look at the results of this experiment. The results were really interesting. The results were that individuals who had gang affiliation, majority of them stayed in the Army, never left. They actually were awarded um, more Silver Stars or Bronze Stars than their counterparts, comparatively. They actually performed at a higher level in combat than their counterparts, respectively. Why? Everything they did in the streets, they were doing in combat. Sense of unity, cohesion, the culture. They were accustomed to having structure. And they understood <coughs> structure. The concern, I think, by everyone, or those who looked at this, was that they were going to get out of the service, go into the streets, and teach tactical movements. Really? They know this stuff before they went into the service. <laughs> they weren't gonna. They weren't gonna do anything new. And in fact, they've actually stayed in the service and have become role models for kids who are in gangs to get out of gangs and join the service. So it's actually uh, been a very positive experience for the army. Uh, an adventure. And I usually put. Uh, I click on it, but I'm. I'm afraid that if I do it, it may not work here. But I usually have this element of adventure. An adventure to me. Uh, if you recall, they used to have some wonderful in the 80s and 90s, they used to have some amazing Navy commercials about you could travel the world, right? And I remember, this is a little camp like this, when I first uh, met my Marine Corps recruiter, uh, Jack, Staff Sergeant Jackson was his name, and I remember going home with all these flyers and pamphlets, sitting down with my wife and going, look, Carrie, we're going to be able to go to... Hawaii. <laughs> I know it's not the Disney cruise, but look, it's a ship. I call it, I call it a boat. Look, they got a boat. Look, they got a boat. And, and, and Camp Pendleton, why well, they have like beach resorts? Look at that, a beach resort. And we were young, and my wife said, yeah, sure, let's, let's do it. This sounds exciting. But I, I, I don't know. i never seen the Disney cruise. I, every time I would go, uh, I'll float. She'll go, oh, you're going on another cruise, aren't you? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're not a cruise. Uh, yes, Pendleton does have uh, beachside um, little trailers that you can lease and, and spend some time, but at the same time, you'll have an LCAC and all kinds of diesel fuel on the beach. It's like, yeah, really, do I want to want that water? No. Uh, but there's an element of adventure, right? And, and for me, my adventure was really interesting. I, was, uh, I went in as a supply clerk. I went as a supply clerk. My recruiter said, Jose, you're married already, you have a young child. You want a job that's gonna give you flexibility, go in as a supply clerk. I'm like, look, I just wanna be a Marine. Whatever it is, I just wanna be a Marine. Uh, a Paris Island had a, a Sergeant Walters, very large, very strong African-American drill instructor. And one day he comes out and says, 
who wants to go to airborne school? Nobody moved. And I promise you, I've never, I've never asked, but I promise you that everyone in that platoon thought the same thing I did. Sergeant Walters is going to throw somebody out the second floor. <laughs> Do not volunteer. <laughs> because we all stood there thinking, because he would do the meanest things possible to us. And I said, he's going to throw somebody out the door. So we all just stand there. <laughs> he's screaming, who's going to go to airborne school? And we're like, here goes Jose again. I step forward. It goes myself and recruit Osario. Osario was all the way at the other end. He comes and he grabs us and shakes us around, throws us around. And we get back in line. And that was the end of it. I didn't know. That's, that's it. I, I, I thought I was going to go out that window. And I don't know why I wanted to take one for the team, but I was going to take one for the team. So what ended up happening was at that time the Marine Corps was short parachute riggers. And they needed parachute riggers in two uh, units. They needed them in Force Recon and Anglico, special operation teams. And that's what happened. I changed my MOS without even knowing it. By volunteering to go to airborne school, the Marine Corps said, well, you volunteer, we're going to no longer a supply clerk. You're going to become a parachute rigger and you're going to special operations. And I never called him up. wife said, hey, I want to go to airborne school. Uh, why are you going to airborne school? Are you going to be a supply clerk? I don't know, but they're going to send me to airborne school. I had no idea. No idea what I was getting myself into. What I did find was this, adventure. I was jumping out of airplanes at 25,000 feet with oxygen and combat equipment in the middle of the night. That's adventure. <laughs> I was diving in the middle of the night with ammunition and no compass. That's adventure. <laughs> adventure, I found. And adventure, we seek when we get out. So what did I do when I get out of the service? I couldn't jump out of airplanes anymore. Fractured my back in three places. My wife wouldn't let me buy a motorcycle because I couldn't fit the car seat. <laughs> what adventure can I find? You know what I started doing? I would do solo cave diving. Oh. I went and bought every kind of cave diving equipment. I took all the classes and I would go at three, you know, 3,000 feet in the back of Jenny Springs and Eagles Nest in Hernando County at 250 feet in depth all by myself. Oh. <coughs> all by myself. And that was tranquil. You know, it was the most peaceful thing I've ever done in my life, besides being at 25,000 feet free falling. Mm -hmm. It was tranquil. Now, I've had options, right? I had the option of buying a very fast motorcycle, and we see young men and women getting killed every day, getting out of the service or while in the service, because that's the speed. I could have gotten drugs, but I never liked the taste of them, so I didn't do that. I found something different, a different kind of adventure. And then I found another one, which is higher education and learning and, and stimulating my brain by being in class and challenging faculty. <laughs> that was a whole different type of stimulation. That was what I was looking. I was looking, I was seeking the same kind of speed I received when I was jumping at, at 25 or 30,000 feet. Your combat veteran is seeking that same kind of adventure. And it's a matter of just tapping the right light. It's just a matter, literally, it's just a matter of tapping that right positive resource for that person. If I could go back to cave diving, I would. I, I loved it. For me, it was tranquil. Now I do research. I think it's, it's not as stimulating, but it's, I get to play with numbers and hit computers. And I don't know. It's, it's stimulating. I look for that adventure all the time. So who are we? Well, uh, females comprise about 18% of the military. African Americans comprise about 17%. Hispanics are between 11 and 12 percent, you know, very representative to, to the national norms. What's really interesting is in, this, in the two theaters that we had, civilian contractors was the ratio was 1 to 10. And that's, that's pretty impressive. The civilian contractors had that type of ratio. For every 10 soldier on the ground, we had a civilian contractor on the ground. Compare that to the Gulf War, it was 1 to 100. And I want to say Vietnam was 1 to like 2,000. And civilian contractors. Now, who are these civilian contractors? They're you. They're individuals like myself. They're our bus drivers. They're teachers. They're lawyers, doctors, individuals who are in our communities that are pulled out for a contract. They're just as exposed to this trauma as a combat veteran is. And that's a whole other population that needs service that we haven't even started looking at the impact of having so many civilian contractors on the ground. 
we haven't even the slightest idea what this looks like. Actually, um, two good friends of mine that, that served with me in the Marine Corps lost their life, um, and one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, a civilian contract. They knew what they were doing, but they can't call for fire. They can't call for that kind of support that they would, they would have been in uniform. It's a risk they're taking. Are they making good money? Yes, they're making a, a very good money. And I remember even one time when the war started, I even thought about it. I started running and seeing, well, how far can my back go? Can I really hike this far? Can I do this? And I tested myself because in the back of my mind, it's like, man, a wolf did it. Lindsay did it. Why can't I do it? And then they, they get killed. And I was like, well, maybe that's not the right thing for me to do right now. But I really, it really crossed my mind just because I miss being part of that unit. I really miss, miss being part of, of that culture. Veterans and families comprise about 63 million Americans. 26 million veterans, uh, 2 million plus are female, 10% are over the age of 65. Now, over and over again, I'm amazed to hear how many World War II veterans we have who've never talked about their experience. Who've never talked about their experience. And one day I was doing a, a conference presentation to this, and I want to say I was in Chicago. Chicago sounds so like I was there. And I'm having this conversation, and one of the participants comes to me afterwards, and she goes, you know, Jose, I had a very interesting experience with this. My dad uh, was in end, end of life stages, and he was in hospice. Uh, literally, like, I think it was like three days before he passed away, grabs her hand and goes, did they ever fix Hawaii? Dad, what do you mean that they ever fix a lot? Yeah, I was there last year and it looks great. What are you talking about? Well, it just happens that he served in the Arizona during Pearl Harbor. His wife didn't know about it and his daughters never knew about it. He held that trauma and that experience all his life and never shared it with anyone. And literally until three days before he passed away. And this, you know, she was telling me she was just in tears because she was like, we knew something was, you know, was wrong with dad. We knew something was driving his experiences, but they could never pinpoint it because he, he didn't have a medal, he didn't have anything. He got rid of everything that identified him as a sailor. What share of hospice is doing for their volunteers now, they're training them to work with World War II. That's, they're finding that a lot of them can't pass, they, 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 they have told their story. And to me that is just amazing. There's a, um, a nurse at Bay Pines that all the time it just it, it held on to it now that and I'm pretty sure if we look you know years from now we're gonna find OIF fats they're in that same situation that they're not gonna want to discuss with their children and family because they don't want individuals to ask questions about what they've experienced and then children and spouses are 37 million 37 million children and spouses. So I had one time I had a, a, a student in a graduate program ask me, uh, Dr. Cole, I know you've got this military social work program here at USC, but I really, uh, that's not a population I want to work with. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do gerontology. I said, oh, okay, well, go to the San Diego, I was in San Diego, I said, go to San Diego Hospice, spend a week there and come back, and let's talk about it. She comes back and she goes, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're everywhere. 63 million. Yes, we're everywhere. So you, you don't have to not go very far. You're going to find a vet or someone that's been impacted by war. But we comprise about 11, 12 percent of the population. 23 percent uh, of our veterans are homeless or comprise of, not 23 percent of our veterans, but the population. And right now we're about 12.1 percent of veterans are unemployed. 12.1% of our veterans are unemployed. <clears throat> this, this figure here, the unemployment figure, makes that post 9-11 GI Bill very attractive for our veterans to go back into higher education. Extremely attractive. I'm working on, right now, on a project that's gonna help them make that transition. On a course to think about this element of how do we transition individuals who either never thought about higher education or really don't have the skills to come right into higher education. What do we do for them? What do we do for faculty, as I mentioned earlier? Because we're seeing, we're seeing the growth. 
Dr. Cole, could you speak a little about homeless and 23% of the homeless population are veterans? You know, I think of veterans as men and women who are capable of getting uh, retirement benefits. Sure. VA <laughs> benefits, things like that. And, and you see the homeless on the street. Right. I don't mean to put it that way. No, no, I understand. That sounds terrible. Why? That's a big question, huh? Why? I spent a whole month in Israel, puzzled because of this. I spent a whole month in Israel looking at, at what they do for their veterans. And um, I, I could have honestly say that the model that, that's currently installed in Israel will be one that if we ever decide to do here, I will support, which is that there is no separation between DOD and VA. It's one department. There's no gap. Everybody understands one transition. I think there's a there's an element of, of service and gap. Personally, even I, uh, being medically discharged, obviously physical injuries. When I moved to Florida and I went to the VA hospital, they're like, oh, we can't see you because all your stuff is in California. I was like, uh, does California still belong to the 50 states? Are we still part of the union? Or did we separate? I didn't realize we separated from the union. <laughs> I was like, I know the Keys try to separate from the Union, but I didn't know California tried to separate from the Union. I was like, how does this work? And there's, and that I think what happens to a lot of veterans is that they run into that wall or that barrier and they just say, like, forget it. Yeah, it's, just, it's not worth my the hassle. It's not worth the headache. I've done it. I'm guilty of it. That I've just said, you know what? I'll just go to my primary care physician, knowing very well that my primary she's going to look at me and say, Jose, you really got to go to the VA because your insurance is not going to cover your back injury because it's service connected. So we just leave it and leave it and then it becomes a much greater issue. There's a lot of comorbid, obviously, disorders and mental health issues. There's a percent of those individuals who don't have an honorable discharge, who aren't going to be able to receive some services. So there's a lot of elements to why this population exists. Um, I participated in Stand Down which is a national program in San Diego that, that looks at three or four days of service to veterans. I was amazed to see officers at the camp. I can't remember last time I seen a homeless officer. I would have, I would have, that would have never crossed my mind to see a cap, an individual who's homeless who was a captain in the Marine Corps. We served, obviously from World War II, Grenada, and I put this other element of non-combat operations. And I put that for a very specific reason, that you don't have to go to combat to experience trauma, or obviously to be a veteran, or to be seeking help. Actually, if you look at the suicide rate among military personnel, the highest percent of individuals right now committing suicide in the military have never been deployed. They surpass the deployment cycle. These are individuals coming right out of basic training, going to the military occupational specialty school, or going right out from boot camp, taking a break to come home, and they commit suicide. They've never been deployed. They've never seen combat. Now, do they have other, obviously, uh, mental health issues that we need to address, concerns that we need to address, maybe at MEPS, maybe at recruiting, uh, I had a great uh, presentation one time at the Marine Corps Depot in, in, uh, in San Diego and had a room much larger than this with all these drill instructors. I was intimidated. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it took me back to Sergeant Walters. I thought they were going to throw me out that window. I had this room full, full of, of hats. And I, said, and I was talking about this. I was talking actually about suicide. And I said, uh, gentlemen, I said, uh, how many of you have been in combat. 90% of that room raised their hand. I said, in all fairness, and if you feel comfortable answering that question, how many of you feel or know that you have PTSD? About 80% raised their hand. Even some officers that have raised their hands. I said, how many of you have actually seeked help for it? I think I had like one officer, a major in the corner, and maybe like five staff and COs that raised their hand. I said, look around. I said, do you think that's impacting the way you train your Marines? 
They're like, no, of course not. It's going to make them better, stronger. I think there's an enormous amount of counter-transferring that's occurring in basic training. Mm -hmm. Enormous amount. And we haven't looked at it. And we haven't looked at it. This element of serving those who served on that. And this from the Library of Medicine of these young soldiers, veterans, right after the Civil War. And going all the way back to 1636, pilgrims were already addressing the needs of disabled veterans. And it says, pilgrims stated that the care of disabled veterans was the responsibility of the colony. And the first legislation about caring for veterans was enacted. Now, who's the colony today? We should be the colony. I am a strong supporter that it should not only be the responsibility of the Department of Defense or the VA, it should be the responsibility of communities to take care of veterans, not just the VA. Yes, the VA is the second largest budget in the nation, but it should not be their sole responsibility to take care of veterans and their families. It should be our responsibility as a colony. Obviously, uh, during the Civil War, we see the Red Cross, and I'm a social worker, so I got to plug in, you know, and kudos for social workers. But during the Spanish-American War is when we see this concept and term, which is an oxymoron: military social work. <laughs> now, Army has about currently Army has about in uniform 134 social workers. The Air Force has about 114 social workers. The Navy serves all of Navy fleet, all of Marine Corps and Coast Guard, and they have a total of. 25 social workers, clinical social workers in the Navy fleet. So it's been a drastic, now they're realizing that, you know, we, we need, may need more social workers around. So they're trying to bring that number up. Their biggest challenge, and I've, and I've talked to uh, Navy Command about this, their biggest challenge is to say, Jose, we have applicants. I have a stack of applications of, of licensed social workers, but they're all coming from the wrong field. I need individuals that understand the military. I need individuals that understand trauma. So that's so that's when USC established this element of let's let's develop a concentration and the Council of Social Work Education develop a concentration in military social work. So we have curriculum now designed specifically for that, which is to train social workers to look at you know military and veterans and the like. <clears throat> Recognition of the need for psychiatric mental health care, obviously during World War One. It went nearly from 100,000 service members. And that number has continued to increase because we start recognizing what war does to individuals. Back in the Civil War, there was a psychiatrist during the Civil War. And I always, I always say this, and I'm going to say it lightly, uh, because every time I say it, I get mixed reviews. And I always look at the nonverbals, and I love it. So there was a great psychiatrist during the uh, Civil War that realized that if we do some form of exposure therapy, although it wasn't therapy, these, these guys, they get over their trauma. They get over their fear. So he would do something really unique, and I, I'm calling it in vivo exposure. So he would get the private tie him to an oak tree. He would get a firing squad on the other side and tell the firing squad, shoot at him, don't hit him. And they would just do this over and over and over again. And then he realized that. When they were let go of the private, he had no problems going to the front and fighting. And this was their mentality of, I'm going to get you over this fear of, of fighting for your country. You're going to get over this element. And, and um, there's some really interesting studies that, uh, that I always failed to remember his name, but they're out there. Some studies of, of some of the work that he did during the Civil War. Um, so here we are, community. This element of, of shock. Individual leaves the military, and it's not that they're shocked. I think there's a level of disorientation. It's kind of like you, you get a compass, and you're walking north, but your compass is telling you you're going south. And you start questioning your compass. There's a level of disorientation. Now, that's not for everybody. Um, you know, I had uh, enormous support from my family. Um, I had academics as a guide. But even with that, obviously, as, as mentioned earlier, I, I had my own challenges in higher education and, you know, why did I want to be a social worker or individuals questioning if I even should be in this profession or not. Um, 
And then you have other veterans who make a very smooth transition. That for them, it was a very nice element. They really never skip a beat. I've got a great uh, friend of mine that I think he's going to be one of them. Uh, I think he's never accepted the Marine Corps, although he's been at it for 20 years now. Uh, he tries to get away with the lowest regs he can. He, I think one time he even got his ear pierced, even though he got written up for it. It's one of these individuals, when, he, when Lloyd ever decides to get out of the service for him, he's going to be like, oh, I, I didn't even know I was in the Marine Corps. But <laughs> then I have another great friend of mine, uh, Sergeant Major Pope. And I know when Pope gets out, because he just called me recently, Steve's going to have a hard time getting out of the Marine Corps. Because he calls me the other day and says, Sticks, uh, what am I supposed to do next? So what are you talking about, Steve? He goes, I'm, I'm about to get out. I'm, I've done four deployments. I really don't want to do another one. I need to get out but I don't know what to do. What do I do next? He's young. Steve is probably only about 41, 42. And he really doesn't know what's that next stage in life. Does he go to hire back to school like I did? Does he retire and go fishing, have a fishing kind? He's, that's that disorientation, which is, and we don't do, in all honesty, I don't think we do a good job at thinking about that transition. And even though we have TAPS, Transition Assistance, I, I promise you that when I was at TAPS, I slept the whole way through it. Because uh, the only thing I was thinking was, give my DD-214, let me go home. Or they had someone speaking to me that was not from my generation and really I couldn't really relate to. Um, so there's all these little elements that we have to think about. Uh, obviously, we, this change of status is not going to be Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Major Pope anymore. It's just going to be Steve. And I think Steve's going to have a hard time. People are not calling him sorry major, because I know Steve very well. And even when he picked up Lance, Cor uh, Lance Corporal, he wanted people to address him as Lance Corporal. But, you know, I, boy, I remember when he picked up Lance Corporal, because I was only a PFC. And he, he would rag me and, and put me through the, just because he had that one rank above. So I can't imagine when he gets out and he's not being addressed as sorry major. It's that status, that element of status. Uh, and of course, thinking about communities. We need to think about, from a community perspective, what do we do to integrate our veterans? What can we do better? Is it something from a counseling perspective? Is it something from a transition perspective? How about our schools? What can we do in our schools, elementary schools, to help families transition better? What's out there? Well, we need to think about these skills, readjustment issues, employment, and it's not the stigma of mental health. I think it's more about the stigma, like I'm, we mentioned earlier, about either being a disabled veteran. How do we help veterans get over the stigma? And then, how do we help employers get rid of the stigma? Not every veteran, and I know it was mentioned earlier, I think Zalakhet mentioned, not every veteran is going to have PTSD. Not every veteran is going to have TBI. It's a great workforce. And that's what we need to be tapping into. How do we help them? And how do we help employers seek that kind of information? <clears throat> from uh, an identity development perspective, I think developing autonomy is, is a major one. This comes from Chickering and Riser. Now, what's interesting is that this theory is really established for college-age students, 18-year-olds, going into, into college and going, well, who am I now? You know, my mom's not around to wash my clothes, and how do I get... I didn't know I had to set my alarm to be in class on time. I think <laughs> Mom always woke me up. Well, if you look at this chickering and riser theory, you can literally take it and apply it to a lot of our veterans and go, wow, it actually matches. Because we're coming out, part of this disorientation, we're having to develop new competence. I wasn't the parachute rigger, force recon marine anymore. I had to become, create new competence, the social worker, the gentle side of me. <laughs> I had to learn to manage my emotions. I couldn't go to my parents and say, you better get your act together and get that paper to me because we've got a grade. Okay. I couldn't do that anymore. I had to manage my emotions and be able to have a conversation. I had to be able to ask, you know, what's, okay, why can't you get this paper to me? Right? I can't say I do that now with my students. <laughs> uh, my students, I'm like, you better get that paper too. Like, now. Uh, we have to create autonomy because part of that chain of command doesn't give a lot of room for autonomy at times. 
Now we have to create autonomy. We have to learn how to sing kumbaya and hold hands, right? <laughs> we have to develop a new identity. It wasn't Sergeant Cole, now it's Jose. It's not even Sticks. If I tell people, hey, you call me Sticks, I'm like, why would I call you Sticks? <laughs> there was a significance why they call me Sticks. There's a meaning, an identity why they call me Sticks. I was the lightest guy in our platoon. I've always been skinny. I can't say that now, but I've always been skinny when I was in the service. And I was the lightest guy. So one day they decided, Cole, you've got to fall at the same rate. I, we're going to do a night jump. You have to fall at the same rate as everybody else. I said, Roger that. I understand. So they got my rucksack and they packed it with all the ammunition we had, an extra radio, extra rat battery. And we just put it on the, on the tail end of the C-130. I walk there, I hook it up, get ready to do my jump. I just roll out because there's no way I could even lift this rucksack. <laughs> and they said that when I hit the ground, it sounded like a stick hitting the ground. <laughs> so from that moment on, it just, they just stuck. They're like, hey, sticks. Because they say when I hit the ground, I hit the ground so hard that it sounded like, <laughs> like a stick hitting the ground. From that moment on, it just stuck. Sticks. And it's S-T-I-X. I don't know. And this is why we need transition programs because we couldn't even spell sticks. <laughs> so then we have this element of interpersonal relationships. We have to learn how to free and develop interpersonal relationships, developing a purpose. This is Pope right here. This is my Sergeant Major friend right here. He's got to develop a new purpose. Not only a new identity, a new purpose. What is he going to do when he gets out? And I think it's going to probably be within a year. And obviously, integrity doesn't fall into that. I think every Marine and every sailor out there has integrity. And that's my bias. So, um, from a world views perspective, I think we really have to think about cultural competence just as much as we think about cultural competence when we're working with Asians and African Americans and Hispanics and any other population. We have our own language, we have our own customs in the way we address individuals, as I mentioned earlier. We have very unique skills. We could blow up a bridge and build a bridge. We have very unique skills. And we need to figure out how to tap into those skills. They have leadership skills. They're unknown. We could sit and wait, because that's all we do in boot camp. Run to one place, we sit and wait. We run to one place, we sit and wait. We could sit and wait. We have very unique values. Values that are manageable, values that are inherent, values that are an asset to any corporation values that you could actually use in counseling and be able to say how did you make it through the service you had similar situations like this when you're in the military what did you have in the military what values do you have in the military that can help you get through this at this moment and obviously knowledge and understanding we need to take account to the family and the unique experience today our family systems are very unique with the multiple deployments and what they're having to go through. Our military spouses are extremely strong individuals, male or female, extremely strong individuals that have an enormous amount that, that they can provide to us. And I'm doing it a little bit faster because I'm pretty sure I'm doing it at 2 o'clock. Am I right? Right. All right. It says not only do they contend with the normal family life cycle, we have all these other pressures of surviving today's world for our families, our military families. The multiple deployments, the extended deployments for the reserves and the National Guard, which we haven't even mentioned. It's an entire uh, group of individuals who don't really fit in the active duty side or in the civilian side at times. They're kind of like in limbo. And how do we provide services to them? And who are they? Right? And how do they fit into all of this? That's the National Guard. We have to understand it from an ecosystem's perspective. Really think about the, the military family and the cycle. But think about, well, what is it like to be on base and then to get off base? I remember when I when I we left Camp Pendleton, I didn't know that Oceanside even existed because everything was in Camp Pendleton for me. My kid's school was in Camp Pendleton. The movie theater was in Camp Pendleton. The bowling alley was in Camp Pendleton. Yeah. Everything I needed was on Camp Pendleton. I come to Tampa, and the VA's on the other side of town. My, my pediatrician's on the other side of town. 
my school is in the only hill in Florida in Dade City. <laughs> so all of a sudden I realized like there's this vast distance between service. And now and my wife and my kids had to be part of that. And I and I, I had just like I had to get a used to this expansion and that everything wasn't, you know, logistically in one place. Uh, I, let me briefly mention the effects of war on children. Uh, this is some of the studies that are currently happening. Now on the DOD side, a good colleague of mine, uh, Ron Astor from USC, um, has received funding from DOD to look at uh, child development, education, um, and looking at you know what is the impact of multiple deployments on children. Some of the things that we're finding is preschool, uh, and I just kind of highlighted uh, several elements here, but obviously increased cleanliness, unexplained crying, that school-aged child, we're seeing increase in somatic complaints, um, they feel isolated, and adolescent and teenagers, obviously self-criticism, increase of anger over small things. And then one of the things that we did find in one of the studies that we're doing is uh, the flat daddy effect. Uh, which is that the child had a stronger relationship, emotional relationship with a picture of their parent that was deployed than with the physical pr presence of the parent. So when, even when the parent came back, they wouldn't actually go to mom or dad who was back to ask questions. They actually uh, attached themselves stronger to these you know, non-physical elements wow. of the individual, called oh, flat, the flat daddy effect. Let's see. Got five minutes? Five minutes. Uh, we could take over half the world in five minutes. Uh, just this concept of, of world views and thinking about the shattered assumptions, and I'm really interested in this element, which is how do we go into the service compared to how we come out of the service and what changes in between? And, uh, you know, thinking about individuals actively engaged in their surrounding. So if they're actively engaged in church, actively engaged in their community before they go into service, what happens when they're in combat? How does that change? How does that change the benevolence of life, their meaningfulness in life? And there's this element that I know occurs, and we're trying to actually measure that at the moment, which is, who are we once we get out? Are our worldviews similar or not? How have they changed? And I think it would be a very powerful tool for clinicians like ourselves to be able to understand that that just within four years or one year of this individual's experience in combat or a non-combat role, they've changed so much. And how can that play? And then be able to address and be able to talk to them about it, be able to go and say, do you remember who you were before you went into the service? How did you identify yourself? Did that also go along with the family? How much the families changed while they've been going? Oh, yeah. Because yes. they act all Yes, that. Most, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, the family then Changing has, yes. leadership roles. Yep. So things that we want to consider is obviously uh, the impact uh, of worldviews have on the relationship building process, on the self self help seeking process. How willing are we to go out and seek help, or do we actually have to be active agents to find them and give them help? And you know. This kind of just looks at this element of, by Janet Bowman on, on worldviews. And Janet Bowman has done a lot of studies and research on looking at worldviews from uh, survivors of uh, sexual abuse and trauma. And we're trying to take that same theory to the military population, looking at believe that the world is a good place. Well, what happens if you did have that belief and then you go to combat? Do you still feel the same? Uh, a just world or this element of, of self-derived from person's willingness. Does that stay intact or does that shatter? Let me get you to uh, really quick. I think we need to be therapeutic witnesses of the process. I think if we are working with veterans who experience trauma, we need to be witnesses and help them ground themselves into that experience. We need to make sense of humanity. We need to try to normalize it as much as we can. Find everything they have that have allowed them to survive in combat 
to help them survive the current combat that they're experiencing, which is this trauma. I'm going to show you this clip, and this is um, this is a program that's funded by the Department of Defense. This program is called Sim Coach. Uh, the purpose of Sim Coach is not to take our jobs by any means. So do not be frightened when you see this. You will have clients, many clients. The purpose of what happened in the Department of Defense said, how can we reach veterans? How can we provide services to veterans? The Institute of Creative Technology developed Sim Coach, and we're we're currently in the process. I said we because I'm still part of that grant. But we're currently in the process of pilot testing uh, Sim Coach, and um, kind of give you an idea. It's a virtual ma case manager. Let me give you a. Uh, this all the time, huh? Let me see if this thing works. It's gonna work. Hi there. The name's William Ford, but you can call me Bill. Welcome to Sim Coach. Hi, Bill. So, what's Sim Coach? Sim Coach is a safe place for war fighters and their families to talk about the things that are on their minds. So, who are you? I'm a virtual human, which means that I'm based on the real experiences and personalities of actual war fighters and their families. Anyway, I'm here to listen, and I'm here to help. Anything you want to talk about? Talk to you. How do I do that? Well, you're doing it right now. Just type in regular English. Anything troubling you? If there is, why would I want to talk to you about it? Well, here, I'll tell you what. I made a video that tells you a little bit more. I'm going to pop it up over here on the right. Not all the wounds of war are physical. When you don't dress a wound, it gets worse, doesn't it? Sim Coach is here to talk about the issues weighing on your mind without worrying about anyone finding out about it. You start off by choosing the Sim Coach that's right for you. Hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. Welcome to SimCoach. I'm Ellie. Then just type in English. Ellie can listen, understand, and respond. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a few questions so I can figure out how to help you better. Is that okay? Everything you say here is completely anonymous, and we've taken a lot of steps to keep it that way. If you don't mind my asking, how's your sleeping been lately? Here's a link on the do's and don'ts of good sleep hygiene. Ellie can send you links to resources, show you a video, administer questionnaires, give you advice, or just tell you a story. So my younger brother Alex was in the Marines and deployed twice. I don't want to say I know what he went through, because I don't. But something he said kind of reminded me of something you might be going through. But the most important thing she'll do is listen to yours. That must have been really rough. Go ahead and tell me more about that, if you can. Sim Coach was developed by a whole group of docs, computer geeks, experts, and writers to be as helpful as possible. And the more the people use it, the better it's getting all the time. Sim Coach, a safe place to talk to someone at a time when it's needed most. Just head over to www.simcoach.org. Thanks for taking the time to listen, Bill. So, what would you like to talk about today? We also have developed uh, virtual patients for training. Um, that's actually a, a virtual patient that has uh, military sexual trauma. Um, there's an enormous amount of work being invested in all these modules. Sim Coaches is, is the one that I'm actually really um, happy to launch. I'm, we're hoping to launch it by the end of this year. And um, it's been pilot tested over and over again and beta tested as well. And the response has been really good uh, by, our, by those who, who participated in it. The neat thing about SimCoach, again, it's not going to take our jobs by any means. It will refer you to clinicians in your area. So it will have a list of clinicians who are you know, certified by their, whatever agency DOD decides and it's going to refer individuals to, to clinicians in their region and allow them, and then it'll follow up. Yes, ma'am. Is this for veterans or for active um, population? D, well, <laughs> good, the good, good question. DOD pay for it? So it's going to, right now, predominantly it's going to be for DOD. Because DOD, actually Army paid for it. Army wanted to keep it, but uh, the Congress said no. 
we have to sign off on it, so therefore it's going to be for active duty. But we, I, we have received the opportunity to, I want to test it with students, uh, kind of like the same element for military and veteran students, and I've received approval to do so. So we're in the process of kind of changing all those elements from an active duty element to you're a college student. So Bill's going to have to have a whole different discussion and introduction. <laughs> Any other, any other an questions? Huh? An outfit and hairdo. An outfit and hairdo, yes. yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.